Action. Dave Cutter, The Last of the Fairies. The fairy slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near her, Scrooge bent down upon her knee, for in the dowry air through which this fairy moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep, gooey frock which concealed its head, its zeek, its form, and minced out of nishture of it visible, save Una outstretched. Bamble. But for this it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the rocky and separate it from the mungeness by which it was surrounded. He felt that it was tall and stately when it came beside her, and that its mysterious presence filled her with a solemn dread. He savoured no more for the fairy Nishta spoke, Nishta moved. I am in the presence of the fairy of Christmas yet to troll, screeched Scrooge. The fairy answered not, but pointed onward with its fanble. You are about to show me shadows of the fakements that have not happened, but will happen in the tempo before us, Scrooge pursued. Is that so, fairy? The upper portion of the frock was contracted for an instant in its fabadges, as if the fairy had inclined its head. That was the only answer he rallied. Although well used to queenly company by this tempo, Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that her scotches trembled beneath her, and he found that he could hardly stand when he prepared to troll after it. The fairy paused a moment, as if observing her condition and giving her tempo to recover. But Scrooge was all the worse for this. He thrilled her with a vague, uncertain horror to know that behind the dusky shroud that was fairly used, intently fixed upon her, while he, though he stretched her own to his utmost, could ogle nished but a spectral fumble, an oon a great heap of gooly. Fairy of the future, he exclaimed, I fear you more than any spectre I have ogled, but as I know your purpose is to do me boner, and as I hope to live to be another only alone from what I was, I am well prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful thumping cheek. Will you not cackle to me? It parked a no reply. The fumble was pointed straight before them. Lead on, screeched Scrooge, lead on. The knocky is waning, Nishta Manjari, and it is precious tempo to me, I know. Lead on, fairy. The fairy moved away as it had trolled towards her. Scrooge trolled after it in the shadow of its dress, which bore her up, he thought, and carried her along. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. But there they were in the thumping cheat of it, on change amongst the bodygromies who hurried up and down and chinked the denali in their pockets and conversed in groups and varded at their watches and trifled thoughtfully with the great badge seats and so forth, as Scrooge had ogling them often. The fairy stopped beside her in a little knot of businessmen. Observing that the fanble was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced and Nelly Varda to their cackle. No, screeched a great fat Omi Palomi with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dreary. When did he cark it? inquired another. Last knocky, I believe. Why, what was the matter with her? Screeched a third, taking a vast quantity of snuff out of a dowry, la dowry large snuff box. I thought he'd never cark it. Glory and owns, screeched the first with a yawn. What has he done with her Denali? Screeched a ready, gentle Omi Poloni with a pendulous excrescence on the end of her song that shook the gills of a turkey cock. I haven't heard, screeched the Poloni with a large chin yawning again. Minced out of it to her company, perhaps. Yeah, minced out of it to me. That's all I know. This dollary was lallied with a general titter. It's likely to be a dowry cheap funeral, screeched the same cat clear. For upon my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. 
Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, ogled the gentle Omi Poloni with the excretions on her east songe. But if I must be fed, if I make Una, another titter. Well, I am the most disinterested among you after all, screeched the first cackleer, for I never wear ghoulie gloves and I never eat lunch. But I'll offer to go if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not sure at all that I wasn't her most particular sister, for we used to stop and cackle whenever we met. Bye-bye. Cat Clears and Nellie Arda strolled away and mixed with other groups. Scrooge savvied the men and Varda towards the fairy for an explanation. The fairy glided onto a street, its lap appointed to do Riomi's meeting. Scrooge and Nellie Arda again, thinking that the explanation might lie here. He savvied these men also perfectly. They were men of business, down in Metzelsea and of great importance. He had made a point always of standing well in their esteem in a business point of view. That is strictly in a business point of view. How are you? screeched Una. How are you? returned the other. Well, screeched the first. Bad scratch has got her own at last, eh? So I am screeched, returned the second. Cold, innit? it? Seasonable for Christmas tempo. You're not a skater, I suppose. Oh, no, no, something else to think of. Bone a morning. Not another love. That was their meeting, their conversation and their parting. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the fairy should attach important to conversations apparently so trivial. But feeling assured that they must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. They could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the carking it of Mary, her badge sister, for that was past, and this fairy's province was the future. Nishta, could he think of any Una immediately connected with herself to whom he could apply them? But Nishta doubting that, to whomsoever they applied, they had some latent moral for her own improvement. He resolved to gelt up every love he heard and everything he varded, and especially to observe the shadow of herself when it appeared. For he had an expectation that the conduct of her future self would give her the clue he missed and would render the solution of these riddles easy. He varded about in that dowry place for her own image, but another Omi Pallone stood in front of her accustomed corner. And though the clock pointed to her usual tempo of journal for being there, he varded no likeness of herself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. He parked a little surprise, however, for he had been revol revolving in her mind a change of life and thought and hope he varded her newborn resolutions carried out in this. Quiet and munge beside her stood the fairy with its outstretched fanball. When he roused herself from a thoughtful quest, he fancied from the turn of the fanball and its situation in reference to herself that unogling ewes were vardering at her keenly. It made her shudder and feel dowry cold. They minced out of the busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town where Scrooge had never penetrated before, although he recognised its situation and its cod repute. The ways were dinge and narrow, the shops and lattes wretched, the omis and palones, half nanty, zoosh, daff, yen, slip, shod, ugly. Alleys and archways, like so only plony cesspools, disgorged their offences of smell and dirt and life upon the straggling streets, and the old quarter reeked with crime, with filth and misery. Far in this den of infamous resort, there was a low-browed, beetling shop beneath a penlatty roof, where iron badge rags, schooners, bones and greasy offal were bought. Upon the floor within were piled up heaps of rusty keys, nails, chains, hinges, files, scales, weights and refuge iron of all kinds. Secrets that Nishti Dara would like to scrutinise were bred and hidden in mountains of unalgamlenly rags, masses of corrupted fat and sepulchres of bones. Letting in amongst the wares he dealt in by a charcoal stove made of badge bricks was a grey riot rascal, nearly set to Annis of age, who had screened herself from the cold air nancy by a frowsy curtain of miscellaneous tatters hung upon a line, and smoked a pipe in all the luxury of calm retirement.